but I would strongly encourage you to get into the, um, into the menu and just start playing with what you have. And, and the first place to start is with shutter speed. So shutter speed, you can create a photo that looks different from what you, you can see visually. Like when you're looking at this scene at the Las Vegas Strip, you're not seeing traffic lights. But the camera can see that by using a slow shutter speed. So this is where a tripod really does come in handy. And this is a shot uh, that's about five minutes long. So you can do some really interesting things with slow shutter speeds. Now this shot is actually two hours long. And basically, again, solid tripod, you set the camera to focus on the waterfall and you just leave it alone and hope you have enough battery and let it go uh, and, and start to pick up the star trails. So I would just strongly encourage you guys to, if you have a clear night, if you can do some of these long exposures, it opens up this whole new world of photography that's a lot of fun. Chris, what um, mm -hmm. time of day was that? Was that nighttime? Yeah, so the, great question. So this is called a, a moon bow or a lunar rainbow. And it happens when the water is heavy, so early in spring, and it needs to be a windy night because the mist causes there to be enough uh, light refracted for the rainbow. So this happens at about, I would say an hour after sunset. Yeah, so it was, it was getting pretty dark and I was standing there alone and it was fantastic because if you know anything about Yosemite, it's about 5 million people a year visiting. Uh, so to be there alone was just amazing. Um, this was where I used to live in the Berkshires, just on a snowy night, set the camera, and this is about a 45 minute exposure. So the longer you let it go, the, the more rich the star trails get. And depending on which star you focus on will kind of determine the, the shape of the star trails. If you were to focus on the North Star, they actually will go in a complete circle. Speaking of circles, so another fun thing you can do with shutter speeds, uh, this isn't as dramatic of a slow shutter speed. This is about a sixth of a second. So just slow enough where you can actually move the camera while the shutter is open. So what I do is uh, at a sixth of a second, I, I click and simply rotate the camera just a tiny bit. And that little bit of rotation creates quite a bit of movement in the photo. So this is one of those examples where I was out, it was mid afternoon, you could see the blue sky. There wasn't much happening, but I was really excited that I was able to create something cool despite not necessarily having sunset or a rainbow or something like fantastic or otherworldly. Uh, and that's kind of one of my goals is can I create something beautiful no matter what time of day it is, no matter where I am? And I think the answer is yes, if you can be creative with your vision and your camera settings. Um, now some cameras have, including iPhones and iPads, built in HDR. I don't know if anyone's experimented with this, but HDR basically takes three or four photos at once and stacks them together, giving you the best of all worlds, including highlights and shadows. So this photo was uh, basically four photos stacked together. So you have the white of the waterfalls, you have the shadows in the trees and on the rocks and the sky. You couldn't really do this in one particular frame because there's just too much contrast. So built-in HDR uh, is a really cool feature. And there are some cameras that are so good at it that they'll take the four photos so fast 
you don't even need a tripod to do it. It just automatically aligns them and stacks them together. Definitely worth checking out. So when I was, uh, I spent the summer working in Yosemite and one of my jobs was to come up with a photo a day that they could use on their social media. And on this particular morning, there really wasn't anything super exciting happening. I was looking for a bear. I was looking for a coyote. I couldn't find what I sort of envisioned, but I did put my camera into multiple exposure mode, which allows you to stack two photos on top of each other, kind of like what you were able to do back in the film day when you wouldn't advance the film and you would take another shot, they would stack on top of each other. So this is a multiple exposure with the first shot being of the cliffs. And then the second shot, I actually changed lenses, zoomed in on the moon, and then had them stack together in the camera to create this. So if your camera has it, it's a really fun feature. And for a long time, uh, camera makers did not include it in digital cameras, but now we're able to do that. White balance. White balance is something that just about every camera has. And if you've ever done any photography in your own home, you've probably seen this sort of yellowish warmth to it to an indoor scene. With white balance, you can fix that very easily and you get a much cooler, more natural type of light. So that's one way to use white balance effectively to fix a problem, but you can also use white balance creatively to add what's known as like a color shift. So if you were outside and you used the tungsten or incandescent white balance setting, which is really designed for indoor shooting, but if you use it outside, you add blue into the frame. So this is a photo that's just a grove of trees. I moved the camera up as I shot with a slightly slower shutter speed on that incandescent white balance, and that added the blue. So to me, this just has a moodiness to it that I liked. So playing with white balance is a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of people just leave it on auto and auto does a nice job, but there are some other cool things that you can do if you experiment with it. And then the black and white mode. I mean, this has to be one of my favorites. Uh, I know when I'm in New York doing street photography, it just lends itself to it, that gritty black and white. Uh, and usually most cameras have an option where you could just switch from color to black and white. It's well worth it. In Yosemite, I did a lot of work that way and I just loved it. Interestingly enough, when you're out and about and a shot does not work in color for whatever reason, try the black and white. You'll often be surprised that a shot that does not work in color will be spectacular in black and white. just shadows on the ground. So those are some camera settings you can experiment with. Okay, now this is something that anyone can do no matter what kind of camera you have uh, and it's the direction of light. This is over uh, at Diavole and we have the light coming in from the side. So I'm always observing light and shadow, light and shadow. And I just loved the way part of these vineyards were kind of dappled with light and the rest were in heavy shadow. Um, side light, where, where the sun is coming from over to the side, really reveals texture. This is the last little bit of sun from the day hitting that bunny on the side of the face. Um, so I'm always just kind of observing light and shadow. It can be really interesting and it can be a very effective compositional tool. This is an old ghost town in California. And I loved the way that one church is just sort of hard. It, it's, I would consider that like a hard light, heavy shadows, but it works. 
this image, interestingly enough, did not really work well as a color photograph. It was much more effective as black and white. So waterfalls are something that uh, I love finding here in New Zealand, and I'm always trying to schedule those shoots on cloudy days. Cloudy days are outstanding for outdoor photography. Basically what happens is you create like a natural soft box. The light is even, you don't have those harsh highlights and shadows. So you're able to see detail in all of the important bits of your scene. Central Park on a nice cloudy day. Uh, cloudy days also help bring out the brilliance of foliage in autumn. It's also good for wildlife photography because you don't have to fight with those shadows and highlights on your animal's face. Notice the very low perspective here, down low, long lens, wide aperture, f5.6 to blur the foreground and bring attention to the deer. Okay, so we talked about direction of light and now there's the quality of light. And we all know the, the many benefits of shooting at the magic hour, sunrise and sunset. Spectacular, beautiful colors, warm light, cloudy days add to the richness of a great sunset. Um, yeah, here's another very cloudy day over in New Zealand. Uh, and a lot of people think that a clear day would be preferable, but for a, a really interesting dramatic sky, you want clouds. So if I'm thinking about doing a sunset and there's a, a forecast of like mixed clouds, partial clouds, that's a great sign that it's worth getting out. Now, if you don't have a great cloudy sky, what you can do is eliminate a large part of it and only show the bits that are more interesting. So in this case, I showed a lot more in a foreground area and only a sliver of the sky because above where my horizon ended up there, it's basically just pale sky. So that's just a compositional trick that you can do. If you have an interesting sky, show more of it. If you don't, show less of it. So this is Ocean Beach, uh, about 20 minutes from where I live. And this is the middle of the day. And we talked about the benefits of magic hour. A lot of landscape photographers would not go out during the middle of the afternoon shooting a landscape but there's value in it uh, first of all you get this beautiful contrast the sparkly water the shadows the mist on the horizon the people in the distance silhouetted that type of scene wouldn't be possible at sunset because you have softer light so i encourage you to actually try and get out at high noon and take a landscape photo it's a different feeling it's a different mood and it also challenges you, challenges you photographically to handle things uh, well as far as exposure. Sunrise. Um, this is, I think, my first morning in New Zealand. I went to this beautiful scene uh, in Napier and waited. And this lady walked down the boardwalk and the other photographers were like, oh no. But I actually love adding people to a scene. It just adds that much more visual interest. And we'll talk more about that. But getting out at sunrise is an amazing time of day. What I usually recommend is get there 30 minutes before the sun even comes up. Just Google the sunrise time, show up 30 minutes earlier and wait. Uh, because once that sun spills over the horizon, the light is gone pretty quickly. This was the last photo I ever took with slide film. 
Um, this is at Montauk on Long Island at Sunrise. Um, Sunrise just has that beautiful, soft, pastel type color. It's just a fantastic time of day. You usually don't have to deal with crowds or anything like that. So if you can, if you're a morning person, it's just so beautiful. It's a great time of day to be out. And sometimes you get lucky and nature just puts on a show. Uh, this is what's called Alpen Glow, where the, the mountains just appear to be on fire. Uh, this is at sunrise in the Canadian Rockies. And I was just floored by the color of those mountains. So was Chris, that this really is, like this that? Not, yeah, oh, this yeah. not retouch? Did no, this is, yeah. it, I actually, I believe, pulled back on the saturation because it looked so fake because they were just so fiery that I actually kind of cut the saturation. Um, Alpen glow. So these mountains are sort of uh, bald. So the rock just lights up. And then, you know, when you're dealing with sunset, you'll be amazed. I am always amazed at how fast everybody leaves. And I usually just wait another 20 minutes or so because sometimes you get this residual color in the sky. Uh, and that's dusk. Dusk is a fantastic time to be out where the sky is not yet black. There's still some color. Buildings start to twinkle. Um, it's just a great time for landscape photography. And usually, you can get away with hand holding a camera at dusk, but it does start to get closer to where you're going to need some sort of camera support. Uh, this is one of my favorite little spots in Central Park on a beautiful snowy day. Um, and as you can see, like once the sun set, the winds calmed down and you got that beautiful reflection. The building started to light up and it was just magical and quiet. There was barely anybody there. I loved it. Um, so I always recommend just hanging out. Don't leave just yet. Uh, again, Central Park, the Belvedere Castle at dusk. Uh, oftentimes, once that sun sets, the winds calm down and you get that reflection. Okay, so I mentioned that we, we would talk about human elements. This is a critical part of being a visual storyteller. Um, when I first started out in photography, I would go to whatever lens possible to not include a human being. Mm -hmm. It's just dreadful to me. But as I've progressed uh, and as I've gotten into more commercial photography, uh, it's very clear to me that by adding a human being, you actually tell more of a story. You add more visual interest. Your photos can become more saleable. Uh, if you look in any adventure magazine uh, or National Geographic, you'll usually see people in the landscape. So it's just one way of going about it. Uh, this is Death Valley, which is, by the way, just such a splendid location. Um, just bring a lot of water because it is brutally hot. It was about 113 degrees that day. <laughs> and this guy was just fully decked out. <laughs> and I just really like the feeling of this lone figure in this vast desert. Uh, this is Iceland in a glacial lagoon. Um, and again, like having them small in the frame sort of leads you to understand the scale that you're looking at. It, it gives the viewer a better understanding of the vastness. Mm -hmm. I got lucky that she wore a red jacket. I thought that was nice of her. <laughs> Um, this is Iceland, by the way. If you haven't been there, once all this pandemic stuff quiets down, this was one of my favorite places I've ever visited. Just really stunning.
just a guy looking at at the horizon. Um, now this is a gentleman in the doorway and I used a very wide aperture to completely throw him out of focus. So you just have this impression of this mysterious figure. Um, from our last trip to New Zealand, I believe Andy and Marcella were with me on this one. Uh, we had an opportunity to photograph um, them trimming uh, the grapevines in the morning. It was just gorgeous. And not every shot needs to have a face in it. It could just be hands. That helps give more detail to your story. So I will get in there, I'll show faces, then sometimes I get in tight and I just show hands. So at Diable, sort of a before and after. Um, yeah, vertical shots. You know it's a woman pouring wine, but you don't see her face. You don't need to see her face. It just works. The viewer gets the idea of what's happening. More people. And it's interesting when you sell your photographs, especially if you sell on stock, um, photos that I might not think would sell well do really well on stock. And usually it's when there's a lot of empty space. And why? It's a perfect place for text, for an advertisement. So that whole vast white area in the top of the image, perfect for laying their graphics down upon. So you never know. Uh, and that's why I do a lot of shooting. When I come home from a place, usually I'll have five to 7,000 images and I don't delete anything. Um, granted, I may have favorites, but there are images in that collection that are still valuable to other people. So I could have been up with them watching this geyser explode, but it was a really messy scene. As you can see, there were just people everywhere. And no matter where I stood, there was going to be people in my photograph. So I decided to kind of step back and look at it from a different perspective and just being like an observer of everyone else watching and photographing the geyser. Um, so this is an example of when you see the crowd, you kind of walk the other way. Now, showing a, including a human element, it doesn't have to be a person. It could be something cool like this little barn off in the distance. Okay, weather and seasons. When I lived in the Berkshires, not far from Linda, I was just floored by the beauty of their, their winters, stunning. And the people there had all these really charming barns, many of which were painted red, and it was just so lovely with the white snow. Um, so if you have four seasons where you live, try to get out during winter when you can, when it's safe, because you could really create some stunning photographs. Uh, you can also shoot in fog and mist. So if you have a warm day coming after a cold evening, that's a sign that you're going to get a really cloudy, foggy morning. And fog can be really mysterious and beautiful. The first frost of the season is always exciting. Autumn foliage, um, just spectacular. And this was in upstate New York. Uh, we had a really special season where just explosions of color. So if you have a favorite spot, if you can visit it in a couple of different seasons, you'll find that things like the water, the amount of water will be different. The foliage will be different. Uh, less tourists when it's colder, so you get a different sort of vibe. This was a shot that 
I didn't think I would get, this is in the Canadian Rockies at um, Lake Louise. It was pouring rain. So I went, there's luckily a, a hotel lounge and I had a beer, talked to a couple of locals and they said, just give it 20 minutes, it'll pass. So I waited, sure enough, the storm passed and you still were left with all these ominous clouds. So even when things look dicey, I still go out with the camera. Um, oftentimes I see a lot of photographers just sort of bail on the shoot and say, you know, the weather's not so good. I think I'll just pass. I'll do it another day. I say go anyway. Bad weather usually leads to better pictures. Uh, this is the Athabasca Glacier in Canada. Uh, and it was crazy because it was a sunny day, but once you got up on the glacier, it was horrible and freezing, uh, but a beautiful scene nonetheless. All right, now, before we get into the next bit, this is just some common photography myths debunked. Does anyone have any questions on what we just talked about? All right. Has anyone heard this one before? Don't center the horizon line. Me, you. Yeah, so centering the horizon line can be super effective, especially when you have reflections. Uh, so this is a full moon. I think it was the strawberry moon. And Lonnie, if I'm correct, me and you were photographing this from other sides of the world. Right, we were. I saw yours, yours was stunning too. Um, yeah. So this was one of those lucky nights where a flock of birds just happened to grace me with their presence and I loved it. But um, centering the horizon line can be very, very effective. So it's a rule that's meant to be broken. And I'll show you a few examples. Mirror-like reflections work really well with the centered horizon line. Now, just because you're centering the horizon doesn't mean you can't use the rule of thirds. So the tower of rocks is still in the rule of thirds, but the horizon line is across the center. That's Valyagi, not far from Dievole. All right, so mid-afternoon. We talked a little bit about this before. Mid-afternoon can be amazing. Uh, you get blue skies. And let me tell you, blue sky photos sell really well. And they just have a different feeling to them than the magic hour. Uh, this is just outside of Las Vegas in the Valley of Fire. Stunning place. Um, yeah, middle of the day. This is off in Sicily. Through a bus window. <laughs> you just get a different feel it's not going to have that dramatic golden light but it doesn't make it any less sellable or cool and of course when you're out in the middle of the day you get to enjoy these amazing creatures uh, and you'll see that really out of focus background that's taken with a super wide aperture of about f2.8 Blue skies, some nice wispy clouds. And again, that feeling that spring is near or spring has arrived. Uh, if you had a dark sky here, it doesn't work as well. So it's just a different vibe. Nice sunny day in Italy. Okay. So exposure, everyone says, well, you wanna make sure your exposure is correct. Well, what's really correct? I mean, technically this is wrong, but it's more dramatic in my opinion. As Chris, Chris, yes. why is that wrong? Well, so it would be wrong technically because there's no detail in the shadow areas. So 
if you were to expose this on automatic mode on your camera, the camera will strive to give you detail in that mountain as opposed to letting it go into a silhouette. If it did that, what would happen is the sky would become very pale, mm -hmm. right? Because the entire exposure comes up. So what I like to do is shoot in manual mode and control the look of my photos and say, you know what, I'm going to let this little bit down here go into a silhouette. And by doing so, I retain that richness in the sky. Uh, so here was just about the shape of that egret or heron uh, and the color and the patterns in the water. Underexposing the boat, again, about the shape. Underexposing the fountain. So if I properly expose the fountain, that pale pink sky would be white. There would just be no detail whatsoever. So I purposely underexposed the fountain and said, I don't need to see the details in the sculpture. I just want to see the shape of the sculpture. So it's just a father and a son, and it just has a, a good feel to it. And we don't need to see their faces, but it works. So oftentimes when you're out, um, try not to fall into the trap of trying to properly expose everything. You can let some things fall to the black, let some things fall to a silhouette, and you'll just get a different type of scene. All right, so this is an old one. Um, always shoot with the sun at your back. But backlight can be really dramatic. Shooting into the sun, some people love those little bits of flare, some people dislike flare, uh, that's a personal preference. But I will tell you that if you shoot into the sun, you can create some really interesting effects. And this sunbeam thing happens at about F22. Uh, and that happens because the aperture opening is so incredibly tiny that the light simply scatters about. Backlight can also be really interesting for animals and critters, insects. And here you got those beautiful crepuscular rays. Okay, this is a fun one. And the idea, of course, is keep everything sharp. But if you create those soft sort of ethereal images, that can be a nice addition to your collection. So these are poppies at about f1.8, which is an incredibly wide aperture. And what I did to get that soft look in the bottom right-hand corner is I actually nestled my camera in amongst the other poppies. So they were actually partially blocking my lens. And by having it partially blocked with a wide aperture, it just becomes a wash of soft color. So it's much softer. And um, here's a beautiful landscape, an ocean. Um, and essentially, I just let the shutter go for a couple of minutes and let it get all misty and beautiful as opposed to trying to show it in some sort of realistic way. I found it more painterly. The deer in the back, does he need to be sharp? I don't think he does. Just the notion that he's there is effective even if he's out of focus. And this is again, having the camera in nestled amongst the flowers. And that's how you blur that foreground element there. The soft patches of lavender, the camera was literally on top of other bits of lavender. 
So don't be afraid to kind of get the camera right in there, whether it's a patch of grass, flowers, really have it on top. I'm talking things touching the actual lens. Chris, what is the light source behind the butterfly? Uh, I believe that is another moth. Oh. It was one of those beautiful patches of lavender, huge patch, and the moths were just loving it. So I must have taken, I don't know, 300 photos to get the one that I liked just right. Um, but the, the concept was, let me get the camera right in there so that the lavender bits were on the glass. And sure, you have to clean your lens after, but it's worth it. You get that soft look. Now, that moth in the background is super out of focus because I coupled this technique with the wide aperture of f2.8. All right, so the last myth, I think we all know it's just not necessary. Um, I just wanted to show you guys what I'm currently using. What I, most of the photos in this presentation um, I took with this camera. It's just a tiny little mirrorless camera. Um, so we've gotten to a point where technology is so good that even the, the most basic DSLRs and mirrorless cameras out there are just amazing little devices. And I talk to so many people who say, Chris, I'm just tired of carrying this 150 to 600 millimeter lens. I'm looking for something smaller, but I'm afraid I won't get the image quality. And, and I can tell you that it, you can, whether it's a phone or something like this. I, I think something like this helps you with the creativity because the phone is somewhat limited as far as what you can do uh, on your settings, but you just don't need a big lens or a camera to do incredible work, so. But can you attach lenses to that? Yes, this has, um, this is uh, an Olympus Pen F, and it has about 150 different lenses made by either Olympus or Panasonic. Um, so yes, absolutely. Yeah, this is an interchangeable lens mirrorless camera. So I do think that mirrorless cameras are kind of where we're going. And even the big two, Canon and Nikon, have recently announced mirrorless cameras that look to have sort of um, put their, their traditional DSLRs on the back burner as far as development. So mirrorless, that word, is an important one moving forward. I, I think that's pretty much where we're headed until we get to a point where phones can do what better cameras can. But We're not, not to get in the weeds too much, but yeah. what, why did we have mirrors and what does mirrorless return us to? So the, the mirrorless, what happens is now you're talking more electronically. So when you're looking through your viewfinder, it's not an optical viewfinder, it's an electronic viewfinder. And when it's an electronic viewfinder, you have things like a built-in histogram. So you can see what's happening with your exposure in real time. Um, and you can do things like immediately port your photos to a Wi-Fi connection. Uh, you can shoot in black and white and see in black and white at the time of the exposure instead of doing it after. So it opens up all of these new worlds. And because there's no mirror that's swinging up and down like this, your frames per second increase exponentially. You could shoot, you know, 50 frames in a second without an issue. So for wildlife and sports, it opens up all these worlds. And there you have it. So, Open, opening it up for questions. I'll be happy to help in any way I can. Uh, whether it's technical, camera related, composition, what can I help with? I have a question about how much post you do when yeah. you have so many pictures and you choose the one you want to focus on. How much do you work on it? I mean, how much do you need to based upon the fact that you are very technical, more technical than I am 
-hmm. in terms of what you ultimately use as your final product? Great question. So my goal is to get the shot right in the camera at the time of the exposure, right? Like I want it to look amazing when I shoot it. Having said that, cameras are only capable of capturing this raw data. And some of it may be not as enhanced as it can be. It might not look the way it looked to you in the field because of the limitations of technology. So a cloud may be pink in real life, and when you get it home, it's pale pink. So I actually do, if you look at like my Facebook or Instagram, most of the photos that I share, I took with this Olympus and edited in Lightroom Mobile on my phone. So I'm rarely importing into Lightroom anymore on my, my desktop or my laptop. I'm doing it quickly in the phone, Lightroom Mobile, and right to social media or my blog. And you'd be amazed at how much editing you can do while retaining the natural integrity of the image, but bringing out what's there. Mm -hmm. So I'm not adding anything, I'm not removing people. It's the real shot, but I'm simply enhancing what was there. Um, and, and I do that quickly, Andy. There are some images that take two minutes, there are some that I spend 10 minutes on, but the goal is, to sort of bring breathe life into what I captured in the field. Uh, in my opinion, Lightroom Mobile is incredible. You you won't believe what you can do in your phone. It's amazing, or an iPad. So is that um, basically like just an app you install on your phone? Yeah, great question. So if you subscribe to the Creative Cloud, which is Adobe. Um, you get the full featured version on your desktop or your laptop. And then you also get um, the, the app. So yes. I did that, sorry, I wanted to see you. Uh, so <laughs> yes, it, it is an app that goes with your uh, subscription. Okay. Yeah, I think it's $10 a month, um, which, Sounds like a lot, but when you think about how you used to buy Lightroom, you would spend about $300 a year on the DVD to download. And once you downloaded that DVD, it was immediately outdated. Mm -hmm. So when you belong to the Creative Cloud, when they release new features, you get them immediately. Mm -hmm. And the $10 a month gives you both Photoshop and Lightroom. Thank you, sir, yes. Um, both Photoshop and Lightroom, some uh, cloud storage space, and the app on your your phone uh, and or iPad. Pretty pretty great. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you for your question. You don't have anything against Photoshop, uh, or you'd rather just use the tools you have at hand rather than completely altering the image. So the word Photoshop is, it's weird. Like it's not even about the product, right? It's just this idea of editing. So I yes. haven't used the actual Photoshop app in years because Lightroom has gotten so good. Uh, it's rather remarkable. I have no problem with it, but I like just my own preference. I think nature is magnificent enough yes. where I don't need to like add things that weren't there, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just bringing out what I really captured in my camera. And I think of it sort of like a lump of clay, you know, so I have this raw photo. And if you shoot in raw, as opposed to JPEG, the camera's not doing any processing behind the scenes. There's no sharpening, there's no saturation, there's no contrast adjustment. It's just raw. So you almost have to go into the scene after and make those adjustments. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just going to say, last year we went to Scotland, and we went to the Isle of Skye, and uh, I never realized what the clouds could be like in a photo. I mean, I just used my iPhone there, and I have some 
really, I mean, they're just beautiful because the clouds were so amazing, you know? So I think, I think, you know, usually you think, oh, it's not a nice clear day or whatever, but really when it was raining or, and it mm. did everything in the course of one day. Sure. You know, so it's beautiful. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> yep. Uh, Chris, Chris taught me, I, I was always like, Chris, I don't like cloudy days, you know? They're like, I like the sun, I like the light, the play, but you know, you've taught me a lot about, you know, the sun makes it almost easier in a sense, and you have to explore the light when it's filtered, when it's not, you know, you know, blue and yellow, you know, and, and all of that. And you know, it it is a different mood, and there's value in all of those different moods. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think about is, um, well, Ansel Adams said, any 12 great photos in a year is a good crop, right? <laughs> 12 photos in a year. So if you could sort of gauge yourself and say, all right, here we are, it's the month of July. Can I capture one image that really says summer, right? And maybe you make a year-end calendar for your friends and family, right? Something like that. It's a way to sort of gauge yourself. Um, and there's going to be value in those stormy shots. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I just love getting yeah. out when it's cloudy. If you have a waterfall near you, just get there. Yeah. <laughs> what are your feelings about the iPhone? And, you know, it's getting better and better and better, multi-lens and all of that. And then there are the apps. Is that a different kind of photography than what you're focused on? Uh, same thing. I mean, we're still telling stories visually, right? We're still traveling places and, and basically writing home, but through our camera. And um, with the iPhone, you have some limitations. Like, could you do that 45-minute exposure with the star trails? No. Um, but you can do some other things that are pretty spectacular. So, I think of it as like, it's part of my toolkit. And for me, it's more like a behind the scenes thing. It's like, hey, so this is me and my tripod set up, you know, uh, or this is my camera bag as I'm hiking up the side of this mountain. So it's like, it's like my sketch pad, but I use my other cameras to do the things that I'm gonna sell because there's more resolution, there's more creative potential. I can blow them up big, print them, whatever I need to do. Uh, and the resolution, when I sell them digitally to stock agencies, I can do whatever I want. So that's very important for me. Maybe we'll get there, Andy, but I, we're not there yet. There's an app called uh, Moment. Uh, the Moment company also makes lenses for, for cameras, but it, it will enable you to shoot in RAW on the mm -hmm. iPhone. Yeah, so, so things are coming along. Yeah. They are. Yeah. yeah, we're getting there. Um, the other thing is just as far as having a, a camera and a tripod slows you down a lot. And it makes your compositions more thoughtful. Um, so if you're sort of running and gunning with the phone, usually uh, it's, you know, not as inventive of a composition as soon as you take the time to bring a tripod and you're scouring the area and you're looking for various vantage points, I think it shows and it pays off. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because, you know, I mean, the, the weird thing is, as a professional photographer, you know this, everybody is now a photographer because they're carrying a camera with them at all times, called the phone. Yeah. Uh, but then there's having an eye as well, whether you're using an iPhone or, you know, you're having heavier equipment that does to your point slow you down a little bit and make you use it more carefully but you know there's there's the quantity versus quality thing too mm -hmm. true really? yeah and i love how you said you know everyone's a photographer um and it's true and and when i'm standing at the roman coliseum and there's you know 100 people next to me and the sun is setting what can I do to create something unique? What can I do differently in that moment to create something that will sell, that will be beautiful, that I'll be proud of, and that they didn't do? So it makes me work harder and smarter, and I like that challenge, you know? 
exactly. Cool. Anybody have another questions? This is sort of an irrelevant question, but what the heck. Um, the uh, the geyser, was that geyser? Uh, that was in Iceland. Yeah, it was an at geyser. I believe so. It looks yeah. sort of familiar. Have you been there? Yes, I was there once. Spectacular, yeah, I loved it. Um, it's They have it set up so well. What's that you tuned out? I didn't find your shot. I was in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> also, by the way, the Pixel 3a and presumably the Pixel 4 will take sh raw shots as well as uh, JPEGs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're getting there for sure. Um, you know, and, and I feel like this is sort of the bridge. It's, uh, it doesn't weigh much of anything. Uh, I have the same camera with a different lens. This is a, this little guy here is a 90 millimeter f1.8 lens. So you can really blur the background. Whereas this little pancake is a 28 millimeter, weighs nothing. So I, I kind of feel like this is the bridge between a DSLR and a phone. Um, and until we get to the spot where I'm pleased with the image quality, I'm going to keep down this road. Mm -hmm. It's working for me. And of course, this is where we started. Yeah. <laughs> have um, you ever, I really like, oh, go ahead. Have you ever used a um, zoom lens and basically taken a long shot, but zoomed in or out? During the exposure? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Uh, Annie knows that trick. We've done that together. Um, yeah, that can be fun. And usually I do that at about a sixth of a second where you're actually like zooming in and out while the shutter is open. It could be interesting. Sure. You taught Marcel that too. And now it's the only way she takes my portrait. It's a little weird. Kathy, <laughs> <laughs> oh. what were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm just very just the regular person taking pictures, not so much a photographer, but I love some of your ideas. You know, I've experimented with trying to get down low, just mm -hmm. kind of on my own, mm -hmm. but I love the things that you were saying about that. And I can see, I mean, we live on a lake and I can mm -hmm. see where I could just change it up so totally if I do that. So thanks. Oh, my pleasure. And you know, with uh, with an iPad and all that, you can sort of see what you're doing. Or if your camera does one of these, you know. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, try not to get your camera wet, but yeah, go for it by all means. <laughs> right. And then are you are you are you actually taking the picture with the remote thing that goes with that, or from your phone? Um, I actually. So I don't use a, a neck strap anymore. I literally okay. use uh, a wrist strap. Okay. Right? Because yep. now when you can see the image back here in real time, live, yep. it could be down here and I'm just looking at my LCD or it okay. could be here. Okay. So I don't need to look through that hole anymore. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, it just makes it so much, it gives you much more freedom uh, rather than just having it like in this position, you know? Right. Okay, cool. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Getting down low and then getting back up again was a lot easier when I was younger. <laughs> I hear you, man. I hear you. That's why it. one of those swivel screens helps. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. I wouldn't buy a camera now without a swivel because it, exactly. uh -huh. it eliminates the getting up part. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I think we'll all be inspired to go out and not just take that shot from in front of us. Um, try a few different things. For mm -hmm. sure. And what I'll do is uh, I will give this to Linda and Michael as a, a PDF and you guys are welcome to it. Um, you know, you won't have the fancy transitions, but so yes. be it. <laughs> Thank you. 
of the reminders. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Chris. This thank is you. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. I really appreciate it, everyone. All right. Oh, Ida, Abby, you. and Jack. Yeah. Thank I was going to say, would, um, are we going to get to see him or is he awake or not? Because those are people who would like to stay and see Jack. Okay? <laughs> and those Fair enough. Who need to go. I won't take offense if people want to log out. I, I get it. But, uh, <laughs> But yeah, I, I definitely want to show uh, you, Linda and Marcella, and, and uh, anyone else who, who would love to see a three-week-old. Today is his three-week birthday. So. Oh, so cool. <laughs> hey. Yes. Yeah. Love to. Yeah, but let me, let me go grab you and, and you'll be doing more of these. We'll let people know. Yeah, I will. And hold on. I, I hear him coming. <laughs> What's his name? walking up the stairs by himself no um Jack. his name is Jack. his name is Jack and uh he's wearing a lovely knit sweater that somebody was kind enough to make for us oh, oh my god he's a dog oh. he's a dog oh, oh, he's, he's all sleepy I think he's in a coma down too low there oh, oh my god Abby how did you do it <laughs> oh, he's beautiful. <laughs> Good work. Good job, is, guys. Most of the day, this is how he kind of chills out. <laughs> Ooh, he's not ready to get up yet. Yeah, exactly. Oh, he isn't. Oh, oh so my weird. gosh. He's what got a lot of hair. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. A lot of hair. He's yeah, a big boy. He is. He's so oh, chunky. Big, big feet. Oh, 10 pounds. Or should I say 4.5 wow. years? Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's little Jack. I hate to try so to stop, but it, is yeah. Abby there? Did she? I hate to I, I don't know. You want to get in the picture? Yeah. Okay, I don't okay, know Mama, we know. You just put <laughs> that baby on. <laughs> hey, hey, good job. Yeah, hey, hey, it was good. We did great. Chris was amazing. Mm -hmm. Oh, my hand and Charlie came in and it was awesome. And oh, yeah. just came in up. It was perfect. So, yeah. oh, good. Well, congratulations. Well, it and it all it all started in New Zealand with it Ilkyo. Yeah. Yeah. And you down the road. <laughs> <laughs> I was the we get to we're there. there. <laughs> you guys look great. Yeah, oh, you okay. <laughs> he is going to be the most photographed baby child person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> he's not fussy because I kiss this kid all day, every day. Like, yeah, I don't care. It's fine. <laughs> can't believe it. Jeez. I was thinking back to our days. I don't think ours was ever that quiet. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope. he's asleep. Are you sure? It's like, baby, is that not a doll? Look at it. He's a doll. This, this too will doll. change. He will not. <laughs> this this is too will. Three week old baby. Oh, oh my God. God. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So beautiful. That's great. Gorgeous. All right. Good all right. job. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Love you. Bye bye. 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 bye.